to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ in hosea chapter 13 verse 11 god said I gave him a king in my anger. I took him away in my wrath. As we study the book of 2 Kings, we are now going to see Israel's downfall through their kings coming to fruition. It was never God's intent, although he could work through it to bring Christ into the world, for Israel to dethrone him. They did that on their own, and now the kingdom of Israel and their downfall and their captivity is going to be seen in the book of 2 Kings. We welcome you to our study today. We want to encourage you to locate your Bible and have it handy as we're going to look to the Word of God in our study today. As always, we're so glad that you joined us for our study of the Word of God together. We want you to know that our lessons are being brought to you by members and congregations of the Churches of Christ. Please visit the Church of Christ in your area uh, there you'll find people who love the Lord and who want to follow the teaching of the Bible. When you visit, know that you'll be an honored guest there. And they would be happy to, to study the Word of God with you about the church or the plan of salvation or New Testament Christianity. If you'd like to know more, just sit down and talk with them and they'd be glad to discuss the Scriptures with you. And friend, here at the Gospel of Christ, that's our motivation and that's our aim as well. Please understand, our motivation in bringing the Word of God to people is for the sake of people's souls. We're not concerned about your wallet. We're not concerned about a love offering. That's not what it's all. No, we're concerned about men and women knowing God, knowing His Word, and ultimately people going to heaven. If you'd like to study further, we'd be glad to help you at the Gospel of Christ as well, or you can access our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you will find a large variety of Bible study materials. We have audio, video lessons, transcripts, study questions, a host of written material. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our lessons, you can download those from our website or we can send you a hard copy. Just go to our media request form and fill out that form and we'll be glad to help you with that. And it's all free of charge. We're not trying to make a dime off of any of this. As we think today about 2 Kings. We're going to look at the purpose of 2 Kings, but just as well, we want to look at some of the practical lessons we can learn along the way. And so what is 2 Kings all about? Well, friends, 2 Kings, as we have suggested, is about the downfall and ultimate captivity of Israel due to their following the king often and the nations around them and their unwillingness to follow God. There are a few key phrases that you will hear in the book. 24 times in the book of 2 Kings, you will hear, according to the word of the Lord. This is happening because you didn't do right, according to the word of the Lord. You will also hear 21 times, because they've done that which is evil in my sight. Throughout the book of 2 Kings, God's people are steeped in idolatry and sin and God is dealing with them just like He said He would because of that. You find throughout the book some key ideas and key chapters that will help us in understanding this and we're going to highlight some of those lessons as we go throughout the book. Now, to understand kind of the history and give us a kind of an outline of 2 Kings, we're now in the time of the divided kingdom. You have the kingdom of Judah, and you have the kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom. Chapters 1 through 17 in 2 Kings are dealing with the kingdom of Israel from King Ahaziah to King Hoshea. About 176 years time span there. Then chapters 18 through 25 are now dealing with the kingdom of Judah from Hezekiah 
to Zedekiah. And so about 155, 150, 175 years in each kingdom, while they run kind of simultaneously, one would be the northern kingdom, one would be the southern kingdom, because they divided after uh, Rehoboam, and there was a separation among God's people because of that. And friend, as you think about as you think about the divided kingdom, as you think about the northern tribes and the southern tribes, friend, the big majority of the kings that reigned on either side were not faithful to God. One of the things that you will seldom hear, and you will hear it occasionally, and we're going to try to point that out, is that he walked according to the ways of the Lord, as did David or as did someone else. Most of the time it won't say that. A lot of the time it'll say he went according to the sin of so-and-so and did evil in the sight of the Lord and led God's people into sin. And so we think today about some of the practical lessons a Christian can learn from this. You know, when you read 2 Kings, you get a lot of history, you get a lot of things that maybe we're not as familiar with. But I want us today to focus on the practical lessons that come out of this great book and even look at some things maybe related to the New Testament as well. The book begins on a high note in 2 Kings 1 and 2 where we have Elijah, that great man of God, great prophet of God. He's going to ascend into heaven, uh, basically get caught up in what the Bible refers to as a, a whirlwind or a chariot kind of, and he ascends into heaven. And Elijah is given a double portion of his spirit, according to 2 Kings 1 and 2. These were both great prophets of God who told the message of God plainly, who in love tried to encourage God's people, and who are reminiscent of a person in the New Testament, John the Baptizer. He's coming in the spirit and the power of Elijah. And, of course, we learn that that's John in the New Testament. And so we, we kind of begin to see glimpses of how even this is going to affect the New Testament. But what a great man of God both Elijah and Elisha were in their service to him and their faithfulness. What made them great men of God? That's the question we might consider. In dark times of idolatry and sin, what separated them? Well, friend, both of these men stayed true to the Word of God and tried with all their heart to live according to the teaching of Almighty God. That's what we need in the Lord's body today. We need people who are going to speak as the oracles of God. 1 Peter 4 verse 11. We need men and women who are committed to the fact that the Word of God is inspired from God. 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 and 17 that it is going to be our judge on the final day, John 12, verse 48, and that living for Christ is the best life you could ever imagine. I love the words of Jesus in John 10, verse 10. Jesus said, I came that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. Are you looking for the abundant life? Well, friend, that's only found in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's then turn our attention to a rather unique scene in the fourth chapter of 2 Kings, I want you to open your Bible to 2 Kings chapter 4, and I want to mention to you something here that is rather unusual, which will point us toward the New Testament again. We've got the scene here of Elisha and the Shunammite son, and in verse number 32, the Bible says, When Elisha came into the house, there was the child, the Shunammite widow's son, lying dead on his bed. He went in, therefore, shut the door behind the two of them, prayed to the Lord, and he went up and lay on the child, put his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, his hands on his hands. He stretched himself out on the child. The flesh of the child became warm. He returned and walked back and forth in the house and again went up, stretched himself out on the child. The child sneezed seven times, and the child opened his eyes. He called Gehazi and said, Call the Shunammite woman. So he called her. She came in to him. He said, Pick up your son. So she went in, fell at his feet, bowed down to the ground. She picked up her son and went out. Now, this expressed uh, the great compassion, uh, the great power of Elisha as a man of God. But it also makes us think about the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and His ability to raise people, right? Uh, the Shunammite son, although raised from the dead, would have to die again one day. Do you remember a man in the New Testament like that? 
His name was Lazarus. John chapter 11. Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus and that whole family. He had heard that Lazarus had died. He wasn't able to be there when it happened. And so four or five days later, he arrives there. He goes to the grave. He cries out, Lazarus, come forth. And a man who'd been dead many days and by this time began to stink, the text tells us, came forth bound in grave clothes. Everybody knew Lazarus. Everybody saw him. That was an ungetoverable miracle. But you know, Lazarus would have to die again. But from that raising, Jesus taught us this lesson. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live again. And whoever believe, lives in me, whoever believes and lives in me, you'll never die, Jesus would say. Friend, when I think about this example in 2 Kings 4, and my mind moves to what Jesus did in John chapter 11, I'm also reminded of a greater raising that's coming. Jesus said in John 5, verse 28 and 29, the day will come when all who are in the graves will one day come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. There is a day coming, that great resurrection day, when the Lord comes, all those who have lived faithful, will one day be caught up together with Him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. And so oftentimes these things kind of shadow in the book of 2 Kings and point us toward greater things that are coming. Now, let's learn about a man and a problem he had and what God told him to do to get over that. The man's name is Naaman, and if you'll notice in 2 Kings chapter 5, Naaman has leprosy. And so Naaman has been trying to get over this leprosy. He's sought other sources. Finally, he learns that there is a man of God who may be able to help him. And so he sends for Elisha. And here's what happens in 2 Kings. I want you to notice chapter 5, verse number 8. So it was when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Then Naaman went with his horses and chariot. He stood at the door of Elisha's house, and Elisha sent a messenger uh, to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I thought to myself. He will surely come out to me. He'll stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hands over this place, and heal this leprosy. Are not the Abana and the Farfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servant came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean. So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was cleansed. You know, Naaman is a unique character in the Old Testament. You can imagine the the physical plight that he has. Having leprosy would be an awful thing as you read uh, about that in history and as we look to the book of Job, very likely some of the things are going on there. But here's this man and he's searching for a cure. Finally he hears, there's a man of God who can help you. And, and so here's what's unique about that situation. When Elisha comes to Naaman, he doesn't even go in his house. He doesn't even get out. He sends a servant to tell him what to do. And it's as though Naaman's almost offended. I thought he would come out. I thought there would be some great show. I thought he'd wave his hands and say big words and there would be something rather dramatic and I'd be cleansed. I thought he'd do that. But instead, he told me to go down to the dirty river Jordan and dip seven times. We've got cleaner rivers right here. Why do I need to do that? He got angry. He got upset at what God told him, and he went away in a rage. And finally, somebody got through to him. Hey, just go do what God said, and, and it'll work. He went and dipped in the River Jordan seven times, and it worked out. 
Friend, the basic lesson is this. Things may not always be the way a person thinks they ought to be. Things may not always be what others have told us or what we've heard or, or the way exactly that we might think it ought to be. But I hope you'll listen real carefully because we're saying this uh, to Naaman and we're saying this about the principle here as well. Friend, we say in all kindness and love, and Naaman realized this, it doesn't matter what I think. And in all honesty, it doesn't matter what you think. The only thing that matters is, is there any word from the Lord? Jeremiah 37, verse 17. The only thing that matters is, what does the Scripture say? Romans 4, verse 3. Now, let's relate that to a similar principle and teaching uh, in the New Testament. Oftentimes when we talk about salvation, people have some ideas or things they've been told or, or have, I think it ought to be this way, when in reality it's not always what people thought that it should be. For example, there are a lot of people who will say, uh, to be saved, just like Naaman was cleansed of leprosy, to be saved from sin, all you got to do is believe. Or you need to say the sinner's prayer, or do this or do that. Well, friend, what matters is, what did God say? And here's what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches, along with hearing the Word of God, believing in Jesus Christ, Romans 10, 17, John 8, 24, uh, repenting of sin, Luke 13, verse 3, confessing the name of Jesus before men, that people must be immersed in water to be saved. And oftentimes when we say things like that, that the Bible says you've got to be immersed in water to be saved. And it does. Mark 16, 16, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. Acts 2, 38, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. 1 Peter 3, 21, baptism does now also save us. Oftentimes when people hear that, they immediately respond, well, I thought, or what about, oh, wait a minute now. And we're not opposed to talking about that and discussing that. And we've got lessons that address that. But friend, can we say in kindness, just like the servant of Naaman said to him, what did God say? Why not just take what God says and do it? Isn't that simpler? When God says, repent, be baptized for remission of your sins. When Ananias said to Saul of Tarsus, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. When Jesus said, unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom. John 3 verse 5. When Paul said, by one Spirit we're all baptized into one body. 1 Corinthians 12 13. When there is such a mass amount of evidence in the New Testament that teaches baptism is for the remission of sins. Why do we want to say, I thought, or what about this or that? Isn't it easier? Just like Naaman. To go and do what God says. In fact, when was it that Naaman was cleansed? Well, you know, as we read in the story, it wasn't until he got over his pride and got over his prejudice and went and dipped in that dirty river Jordan. When will people be cleansed and right and holy in God's sight? Well, friend, it's when they do what God said. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now let's think then about some other practical lessons that we can learn from the book of 2 Kings and I kind of I kind of want us to move forward a little bit in the book of 2 Kings because of time restraints and as we look through this book there are a lot of kings who really didn't do good. You will find a multiplicity of kings in both kingdoms who the Bible will say multiple times he did evil in the sight of the Lord and caused Israel to sin. That's a big number of the kings. And so rather than focus on them, I want us for just a moment uh, in our time remaining to focus on a king who did a, a lot of good in a very dark time in Israel's history. Would you flip over with me to 2 Kings chapter 22? And I want us to think about for a few minutes, good King Josiah. Look in 2 Kings chapter 22, and I want you to see what's going on here. 2 Kings 22.1, where we learn of Josiah. Josiah was eight years old when he became king. He reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. It goes on to tell us his mother's name was Jedidiah, the daughter of Adiah of Bozkath. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord, walked in all the ways of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. And so as you initially think about good King Josiah, 
Boy, he got a young start. Eight years old, reigned 31 years. But the commentary on his life is, on his kingship and his life is, he did right. He did good. Well, if that's the case, and he is different and not the norm of that day, what made good King Josiah different? Well, let's notice what that was. I want you to look in your Bible in 2 Kings chapter 22. And in the context, they're trying to uh, restore worship. They're trying to restore the temple of God, things like unto that. And listen to what is said in 2 Kings 22, 8. Then Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. Now watch what happens in verse 11, 2 Kings 22, 11. Now it happened when the king heard the words of the book of the law that he tore his clothes. Verse 13, here's what he said. King Josiah said, Go inquire of the Lord for me, for the people... For, for all Judah concerning the word of, the book, of this book that has been found, for great is the wrath of the Lord that is aroused against us because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. What made Josiah different? Here it is. Josiah started searching for God at a young age. He started restoring worship. He started trying to rebuild some of the mess, including the temple that Israel had brought upon itself. And in the process of cleaning up and fixing up and trying to get things back right with God, they stumble upon something. Can't you imagine if you're Hilkiah the scribe or Shaphan the high priest or Hilkiah, and here you stumble upon, you're in the temple, you stumble upon through the rubble, and lo and behold, there lies the Word of God. All these years, it's lied in these rubbles. It's laying here and has not been in people's hearts and minds. And so they find the book of the law of God. Uh, they cry out to people, look what we found. They take it to the king. He reads it. They tear their clothes. They rend their hearts. And they approach God in humility of spirit. For they know for a long, long time, the people of Israel have not been following and doing like they should. And so what do we learn from good King Josiah? Here's a man during a very dark time, a man who was very young, but he made a commitment to do what's right, and he followed through with that, and he promoted that among others as well. This man exalted the Word of God in his own life and in the life of the people he influenced. And friend, there's such a practical lesson as a Christian, living in a world that is filled with immorality and facing temptations on every hand, what can we do? Friend, let's exalt God's Word and His teachings in our life and everyone that we can influence. Let's try to get them to do that as well. The Word of God is living and powerful. Hebrews 4 verse 12. We're to realize that it is that which is able to save our soul. James chapter 1 verse 21. And that this is how God wants us to live. And friend, we got to knock the dust off of it sometimes. Just like they did. And turn our heart and life back to the Word of God. Now, notice how far good King Josiah took that. I want you to listen. In 2 Kings chapter 22. Listen to what the Bible says in verse 18. But as for the king of Judah who sent you to inquire of the Lord in this manner, you shall speak to him. Thus says the Lord God of Israel concerning the words which you've heard because your heart was tender. Listen, your heart was tender. You humbled yourself before the Lord you God, your God when you heard what I spoke against this place and its inhabitants that they will become a desolation and a curse. You tore your clothes. You wept before me. I also have heard you, says the Lord. Surely, therefore, I will gather you to your fathers. You shall be gathered to your grave in peace. Your eyes shall not see the calamity which I will bring on this place. So they brought back word to the king. Josiah restores worship. He tears down the idols. He punishes those who have been doing wrong. And during his reign, there was peace and prosperity in the house of God. Now sadly, just three chapters later, Israel goes away into captivity. But you know what? Josiah, for a period of time, put a stop to that. And you know what else he did? I believe his actions had an effect 
on people's souls. They restored what was right. They gave reverence to the Word of God. They're now worshiping and doing what God wants us to do. And friends, sometimes we think, and especially, I would say maybe young people feel this way. You think, what can I do? How can I affect people? Friend, please listen carefully. As a young person, as a Christian, whatever position you may be in, you have influence. You're never too young to start doing what's right. And if you'll do what's right, others will see it and it will have a great impact on them. This is why Paul said to Timothy, be an example to the believers in word and conduct and faith and love and spirit and purity in every way. Be an example just like King Josiah was. And so what's the basic lesson we learn uh, from the book of 2 Kings? Friend, it's not a real pretty lesson at times, but the basic lesson is when men and women as a people stop looking to God and His Word and stop living the way God wants them to, calamity is going to come. There will be days of despair that follow that. But like with Josiah, when we turn the tide and we go back to God and His Word, God will bless those who follow His way and do what He says. Friend, as always, we want you to know today that the God of heaven loves you deeply, that more than anything in the world, He wants men and women to be saved. 1 Timothy 2, 4 says God wants all men. How many? God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And God went to this length to make sure that happened. God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Do you believe in Christ as the Savior of the world? Would you turn from sin to God in repentance? Luke 13, verse 3. Would you acknowledge with your mouth Jesus as the Savior? Acts 8, verse 37 and 38. And friend, to get into Christ, would you be baptized in water for the remission of your sins? Here's what Jesus said. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. May God help each of us, just like in the days and times of the kings, to give our heart to the Word of God, to strive to serve Him, and to do everything we can to honor and magnify Him. May God bless us as we strive to do just that. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.